Um, something I didn't mention in the opening was that Charles also does a one-hour music show every Saturday afternoon, 5 to 6, five to six. called The Smart Set, which well, I'll let you explain okay. that a little bit. Okay. Coming to you live from the Smart Den, coming to you live from the Countdown Room here high atop the Imperial Hotel, this is the Smart Set, Jazz 90.1's weekly running with a Rochester swing scene. I'm your host, Charles Benoit. Well, they're swinging like a pit bull full of postman's arm here at the Countdown Room. And, and so it's a, it's a running banter show like this where I invite musical artists who aren't obviously in the studio. I mean, it's been a while since Cab Calloway's been on the stage. But uh, each week, and I'm going to ask Cab Calloway's in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Here he is on the stage. And I've got crowd noises, and I've got cheering people, and I've got drunks in the background to do those kind of things. And uh, that, that show is a total different thing for me to write. It's deliberately, it's schwarmy, it's over the top. You know, Remember, folks, if you should see any underage drinkers here with the red fez, make sure you point them out to the wait staff. They're eligible for our first time drinkers club. <laughs> <laughs> and, and little things like, you know, it, it's the county, it's the, uh, the, the teeny village motor inn on exciting Ridge Road West. Yes, yeah, it's a long Rochester tradition, long Rochester family tradition. A favorite post prom gathering point, uh, rendezvous for adulterous couples. Ask your parents about their favorite <laughs> tiki, memory, tiki, uh, tiki lounge memories, then head to the Blue Boodle Lounge and drink till you forget. So it's, it's, it's deliberately over the top, and it's an industrial solvents and police raids and things like that, a very light, upbeat thing. Interestingly enough, that won me a communicator award. So it's, it's the only it's the only award. I feel so bad. It's the only award the radio station has ever won. I mean, there, there, there's DJs there, and the station's been around forever, and they win for this. Uh, so it's uh, they've got to write, let, it, let me live it down. But um, that interest in jazz, which you're going to ask about, because uh, in Jazz, there's, it's, there's almost a noir feel to it. Uh, if you're a Brian Setzer fan, he just recently released a CD that is being called Big Band Noir. And it, it's, it's his take on it, a, a, a soundtrack to an imaginary noir film. And it's got its femme fatale song, and it's got this uh, big of the God, King of the Goddamn World is the song he does with Eddie Nichols of uh, Royal Crown Review. So there's always been that, that noir setting. And uh, David Goodis in tonight's film, uh, makes big use of Count Basie. And he ventures in the novel seven Count Basie tunes. And uh, I, I don't know why jazz artists love, I mean, why noir artists love jazz so much. But it's interesting, because in David Goodis, he didn't like the jazz you'd think he'd like. You know, the real dark, dark, one note, dismal, is this song over yet type stuff. <laughs> he, he liked the kind of stuff I liked, the upbeat. We're going, we're dancing, we're having fun, everything's good in the world. And it seems so opposite of who they are in personality that so many of the, the noir writers liked big band and didn't care for the music we associate with noir, the bebop and the, the New York City sounds of the 1960s. They were definitely children of the swing age. Uh, but specifically what Goodis did was he used that jazz as uh, support for the characterizations within the novel. Right. Um, there's a couple songs in the novel that have to do with it. For example, there's a song, uh, I sent for you last week and here you come today. Now, as you watch the film, see how many times that could be, you know, somebody who was supposed to come and comes later and just misses when they were supposed to be there. And if they had only been five minutes earlier, everything would have been different. That it's a reoccurring theme in the novel of, oh, just a little late. Um, and that comes in. My favorite, uh, if you know the movie, you know where this is going to lead to, but I'm not giving anything away. My favorite song is this real upbeat number. It's a poppin' upbeat number called Out the Window. <laughs> and uh, when you see the movie, you'll say, hey, I know where that goes. Um, so it, it's a real, it, it, the, num the songs don't fit what you'd expect them to fit. And they're classic Count Basie tunes like uh, One O'Clock Jump and Shorty George. And so they're, 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 they're moving kind of things. But he, doesn't necessarily, you, you can't have insert CD and listen while you're reading and the song comes up when you're supposed to. There's only a few conversations, and it's amazing how much the dialogue in the book is word for word the dialogue on the screen. So when they're talking about the, uh, the Count Basie stuff, that's lifted right out, easy to have for the copywriter, or the, the screenwriter, who was David Goodis until unexplained reasons left the movie in mid-shoot. But and it was common with David Goodis. Um, moving toward uh, writing the novels again, uh, 
Charles worked as a, a teacher in Kuwait, teaching English as a second language. He used this as an excuse to hop around the entire Middle East on the weekends, uh, and which became the basis for a lot of the detail that went into his first novel, which got nominated for the Edgar Relative Danger. Um, but there's more research that, that goes into your books. You, you actually went to India and to Thailand to examine these places. Uh, any interesting stories from that? Uh, no, I basically stayed at Holiday Inn. No, it, it, uh, it, it, we had been traveling, my wife and I had been fortunate to um, both be bit with the same travel bug and, uh, and bit with the let's not have children bug. So we, we've been able to travel quite a bit and see quite a lot of things. And my wife is, has, is a very adventurous spirit. So there have been many times in many a city when it's been late at night and I've been looking around at a bar going, huh. Never thought I'd see this in a bar, and my wife would lean up and say, huh, but you never thought you'd be in a bar like this. Uh, it, there's a lot of very interesting places that you can get to in these. Um, we were, uh, like, there's it's strange incidents. There was once, uh, we were in Damascus, Syria, and it was the first night of Ramadan, and we were out at a bar that at a certain time, it is now midnight, bam! Liquor's cut off, take your drinks away, that's it, Ramadan. And that's when the famous sparkler incident happened. And we're sitting in the bar. My wife is, I think, the fourth woman ever to enter the bar since, I think, 1215 was the first. Uh, I don't know if that's the Arabic calendar or what, but that was the last time another female was in the place. So we were sitting in there, and these gentlemen in the back, all in their 20s, not drinking anything, um, pull out a box of sparklers. And they would light one, and everyone would sit around the table and watch this. No televisions. There was a sparkler, damn it. We don't need a television. You got a sparkler. And they'd sit there and watch the sparkler, and it would burn down. It would go out, and go, dog. I don't want to how, how, why, why. That was like, one time, one time. And they'd light another one. And they'd watch it burn down. And I think, wow, this is this is this this is better than the first one. And this went on for three or four sparklers, and then, well, bedlam. Uh, one of the gentlemen reaches over and takes the sparkler out of the other guy's hand and drops it on the floor. I'm not kidding. Within a few minutes, the bartender's over the bar with a baseball bat. We're, we're trying to get out of this place before we get seriously, it's a sparkler, people! <laughs> uh, so we've had a few incidences like that where we've been in situations where it's just, I don't know if this is, this is where we should be at the time. Uh, I was in Thailand when I went to research uh, Noble Lies. Um, I remember it was December, and I was saying to my wife, um, I was in the middle of writing the book, and I said, you know, we've been to Thailand many times. I've never been back after the tsunami. It's been almost a year since the tsunami hit, and the story set a year after the tsunami. And the muse isn't with me. I think I need to go back to Thailand to, um, to recapture the essence, to, to smell the spices, to, to feel the sun, to, to hear the language, to walk the streets. And she said, it's winter in Rochester. Your muse has nothing to do with this. <laughs> so fortunately, she knows this and understood it. So I, I'm, I'm back in Thailand, and I'm drinking at a bar. And um, I order some whiskey off the back shelf. You get a little bottle, get the whole thing. And I just, there, there, everybody's in the bar. It's like one of these piano playing stop moments. I said, yes, that one. No, that one. Next one, that one. The guy puts his hand on it, and people around the bar go, <gasps> Yeah, that's the one I want. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> they bring it out, and they set it down, and it's all in Thai. It looks like whiskey. I have no idea what it is. And so they bring me a glass, and they set it down, and they bring me a glass of water next to it about the size of a quart jug. And they pour it a little shot. And everybody's looking at me sort of like you're looking now. And like, cheers, cheers. And you're sipping it, and it's... Um, I, I can't think of the name of the whiskey, but the one that tasted like um, like Nyquil, it was it was a lot like that. And uh, I, I find out two or, two of these, two shots of this whiskey, and I'm realizing, hmm, are those walls melting? <laughs> and uh, there, there's it's it, it's it's made with a certain kind of root that has a hallucinogenic in it, and um, unbeknownst to me. So uh, I have another bottle of this that I brought back home that's still in my bar unopened, and I'm just waiting for that special night, special guest, uh, just to crack that one open. But um, there, there are plenty of adventurous things out there. You just have to get off the beaten tracks, and you have to get out to see them. Uh, there's most places we've traveled, one of the most disappointing things was being in Morocco, Casablanca, and coming around the corners to the McDonald's, Casablanca. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little disappointing and depressing. Uh, 
And, and we, we were in Singapore, which is a wonderful, fabulous, fantastic city. But then to realize, huh, look at that. The gap is next door to the Old Navy, not across the aisle. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> um, so if you want that, that, that experience that everything is the same, it'll be safe and comfortable, we have never traveled anywhere, with my wife would say with the exception of India, that it is, it's not absolutely easy and comfortable to get along in. But if you're looking for adventure, it is so easy to find. Um, I, I, I don't know what it is. I must have a, a shirt that I wear that I don't even realize what it says when I'm in India. But daily, I, almost hourly, somebody comes over and tries to sell me a chess set and opium. <laughs> it's, it, 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 buddy, you look like an opium smoker. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but everywhere I go. So if you're looking for adventure, it'll come and find you. You've just got to go looking for it.